Praise be Jesus and Mary. Today we have uh, two blessed stories sort of uh, almost in competition. We have to pick one of them, and of course we pick St. Faustina because she's um, better known, more popular. But we also have a, a debt to, to blessed Francis Xavier Silos, uh, who, who uh, worked to evangelize in, in this country. Now we owe our, our faith to the missionaries who, who came before us who helped to spread that faith and, and educate our ancestors. Blessed Silas was born, so first we'll talk about him uh, in chronological order and then get to St. Faustina. Blessed Silas was born on January 11th, 1819 in Bavaria, a particularly Catholic part of Germany. He was a sickly child who seemed destined to die young, as happened to three of his 11 siblings. At nine, he received confirmation, and after that, he didn't get sick as often. As a child, he did well in school, and he would also play priest. In 1837, while he was in high school, or more properly, gymnasium, he joined the Greater Latin Marian Confraternity, whose other members over the centuries include St. Alphonsus, St. Bernadette, and St. Therese. After graduation, he went to study philosophy and theology at a university in Munich in preparation for eventually becoming a priest. There he got to know the Redemptorists, and he applied to enter the Redemptorists in America. He would be a missionary serving German-speaking immigrants. He was accepted, and on March 17, 1843, he sailed for New York City. After a year as a novice, he made his profession in, and was ordained a priest. Well, he made his profession in May 1844 and was ordained a priest December 22nd of that same year. In August 1845, he was assigned to the parish of St. Philomena in Pittsburgh as an assistant pastor under St. John Neumann, or Newman if you prefer. English uh, was, he had a lot of trouble learning English, he, so he thought that perhaps he would just, uh, just minister in German. But there was such a need for confessors that he began accepting confessions also in English, hoping that he would understand. And by the help of God, he found that he was able to confess well in English. He became a sought-after confessor and spiritual director. People would even come from, from neighboring towns from outside Pittsburgh to, to confess to him or to ask his advice for the spiritual life. During a retreat in 1848, he committed to achieving holiness. But he knew it would be hard. One of his, one of the things that he wrote in his his notes for the retreat was, "O oh help, O oh help, O oh holy Mother of God, let me not, let me become so inflamed and sanctified that I'm not always thinking of breakfast." He became the pastor of Saint Philomena's in 1851, and the following year he became a U.S. citizen. Two years later, he was transferred to Baltimore, and he would spend the next several years in Maryland. In 1862, he was chosen to lead an itinerant parish mission band that would preach in 10 states over the next two years. He didn't seem to, to, he doesn't seem to have come to Indiana, but he did preach in Ohio, Wisconsin, and Illinois. And sort of like the, the, the gospel for today could almost be uh, a gospel for, for his feast, because this is a gospel that's used uh, for, uh, for the feast days of, of priests who would like the as the 72 disciples uh, were collaborators of the apostles, so uh, priests collaborate with or cooperate with, uh, with bishops, or of course the successors of the apostles. And so after his time as a, as a traveling missionary, he was stationed in Detroit for a year, and then on September 28, 1866, he was transferred to St. Mary of the Assumption in New Orleans. In the train on the way down, he met a sister of Saint. Oh, he met a sister of Notre Dame, who asked him if he was going to stay long in the city. He replied, "For a year, and then I will die of yellow fever." He was a prophet. That's exactly what happened. Yellow fever broke out in New Orleans on September 3rd, 1867. Like a good pastor, he served the sick, and uh, as did his confreres. Eleven Redemptorist priests and brothers in that area caught the disease, and four would die of it, including our Blessed, who got it on September 17th and died on October 4th, 1867. 
Thirty-eight years later, St. Faustina was born in Poland, in the village of Głogowiec. She was the third child of farmers who were poor in money but rich in faith. She was baptized Helena, and seven siblings followed after her. That is, no, were born after her. As a child, she showed a love of prayer, work, and obedience, and a sensitivity for the poor. At seven, she already felt drawn to religious life, but her family was reluctant to let her go. They needed her help as one of the, the older sisters. She did a lot in the family. To help her family at 16, she left home to work as a housekeeper in, in nearby cities. One day when she was 18, she had gone to a dance. Christ appeared to her suffering and said, How long shall I put up with you, and how long will you keep putting me off? That is, when will you respond to your religious vocation? She wept and went to the cathedral to pray. And eventually, after long prayer, she was told in the depths of her heart to go to Warsaw. And so she left that very day. There she knocked on the door of various convents, but she had no dowry and no prior contact with any of those congregations. So she was repeatedly turned down. God was telling her to do something, and it seemed impossible to do. Eventually, she knocked on the door of the Sisters of Our Lady of Mercy. She spoke to the Mother General, who asked her to go into the chapel and ask the master of the house if this was the community for her. She went and prayed before the tabernacle, and our Lord said to her, I do accept, you are in my heart. She told this response to Mother Michaela, who agreed to admit her. However, first she would have to work for a year and save some money to have a dowry. She entered the congregation on August 1st, 1925, and received the name Sister Mary Faustina. She was a, a sister for 13 years, working as a cook, gardener, and, and porter in 14 different convents in Krakow, Vlach, and Vilnius. Externally, there was nothing special about her. She was a good, hard-working sister, but nothing more. But God had chosen her to be the apostle and secretary of his mercy and gave her frequent mystical experiences, which she wrote about in her diary. Only those who guided her knew of this. For several years, she was prepared for her mission by various experiences that included a visit to purgatory. Purgatory is both an expression of God's mercy and something from which His mercy wants to save us and can save us if we respond very generously in this life. Her soul was purified by trials, including a spiritual dark night. Then, in Vilnius, on February 22, 1931, Jesus appeared to her as the King of Divine Mercy, wearing a white garment with red and pale rays coming from his heart, as you can see in the Divine Mercy image. He told her to paint an image according to what she saw, with the signature, Jesus, I trust in you, and promised graces to those who would venerate it. But she didn't know how to paint. She told her confessor, who, who said, well, you should paint the image of Jesus in your soul. But as, as soon as she left the confessional, Jesus told her that that was not what he meant. She talked to her mother superior, who wanted a, a sign that Jesus was speaking to, to St. Faustina. But Jesus replied, I will make this all clear to the superior by means of the graces which I will give through the image. This is like when God appeared to Moses in the desert to ask him to let his people go. Moses asked for a sign, and God replied, This shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought, out, brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. So you'll get the sign when the job is done. Now, Moses insisted and eventually got a sign before he started. But St. Faustina didn't get a sign quite so quickly. She did get a sign before the image was painted, but uh, not a sign to convince her, her mother superior, because she was then no longer in that, in that convent. She struggled for, for uh, in some years, or a few years, with the apparently impossible task of trying to accomplish something that she couldn't do personally and couldn't get any help to do. Matters were made worse by the fact that she had no permanent confessor, no priest, uh, to guide her in a stable way, who could, could understand, uh, understand her and know how to lead her. Uh, she was just sent wherever uh, a sister was needed to work. And she was you know, very useful because of 
uh, she was such a hard worker and a good sister, so they sent her to, to 14 convents in the, the course of her 13 years of religious life. Eventually, she met Father Sapotsko, or Sapotsko, who, whom our Lord indicated to her as the visible help for you on earth. He became her spiritual director. He examined her mystical experiences and found them sufficiently trustworthy to proceed with, with having a painting made. He found an artist in Vilnius. St. Faustina found it hard to explain what the painting should look like, so she asked Jesus for help and got an explanation of the two rays, as well as a request for Divine Mercy Sunday to be instituted. When she, she saw the painting, it was a great disappointment to her in comparison with the beauty of, of Jesus in her visions. But he explained, not in the beauty of the color, nor of the brush lies the greatness of this image, but in my grace. Now the image was made, but it had to be publicly venerated. And she was told that it had to be placed on the eastern gate to Vilnius. Now, the eastern gate is a symbol of Our Lady. It was the eastern gate of the temple in, in Ezekiel's vision uh, that uh, represented Our Lady and, and her virginity in particular. And Vilnius had, had dedicated the eastern gate of their city to, to Our Lady. Saint Faustina told Father Sopochko uh, what Jesus wanted done, but he didn't see any way that he could, could go about it. He didn't have any authority to put that, that image on the eastern gate. Then he was invited to preach uh, unexpectedly at, at a jubilee celebration held at the gate on April 26th to 28th, 1934. These were the last three days of the octave of Easter, so it was leading up to the Sunday after Easter, the future Divine Mercy Sunday. Father Zupachko asked for the image to be displayed next to the icon of Our Lady on the gate and was told no, but later the Archbishop suddenly acquiesced. So he preached for three days about Divine Mercy and the image was publicly venerated. St. Faustina Kowalska and, or Kowalska and Blessed Michael Zupachko had done what they could and Jesus did the rest. Further revelations followed about the Divine Mercy Chaplet, the Hour of Mercy. Meanwhile, St. Faustina's life was drawing to a close because as her mission it was drawing to a close. In 1934 she got tuberculosis and by 1936 it had worsened to the point that she had to be admitted to a sanatorium. She was in and out of the sanatorium for the, the next two years until her death on October 5, 1938. After her death, Blessed Michael Sapochko wrote a booklet that made parts of the Divine Mercy message known, and then the, later the publication of her diary made the message more fully known. Praised be Jesus and Mary. Amen.